We always had trouble keeping up with Jesus. If you read the Gospels, you've got Jesus always on ahead of his disciples. Uh, the Gospels all depict Jesus as on this perpetual road trip. He never stays anywhere long. One of Mark's favorite words is that little Greek word for immediately. Jesus said this and then immediately he goes there and then he says this and then immediately he goes there. And th that's, that's the image you get of Jesus during his earthly ministry. But after his resurrection, wow, he really speeds up what has already been a uh, high motion uh, experience. Just last Sunday, we talked about how Jesus' disciples are gathered down, hunkered behind these closed, locked doors, and the risen Christ appears before them. He now goes through doors. He is out in Galilee in an instant when, when we're back at Jerusalem at the tomb, and, and Jesus Christ is presented in the Gospels as a body in motion, as if in his resurrection, everything is speeded up. But notice our reaction. In today's story of the walk to Emmaus, uh, the disciples say to the risen Christ when he appears among them, stay with us. Or in the old King James, abide with us, leading to that beloved hymn, abide with me. Stay with us, we say because there's something about us that is uncomfortable about the risen Christ in motion. Because there's something about us, we want to fix Christ. We want to stabilize, to, to take his presence and define it and confine it. You will notice this church is built to look at least 500 years older than it really is. Because we want the citizens of Durham to think we have been here since the Italian Renaissance. We are here and we're not going anywhere. And if you'll notice, you're seated in ways that you're very rarely seated. Uh, you're seated in pews bolted down to the floor. We don't, we want to fix this thing. We want to stabilize it. In fact, that may be the whole purpose of, of theology. Uh, is uh, various attempts to conceptualize God in such a way that we can fix God into orthodox doctrine and to, we can fix it and stabilize it. Uh, in my local church in mission class, I have the students read through the Acts of the Apostles in tandem with the Course. The Acts of the Apostles, which tells about the early church in its first days, and at the end of the class, I ask them, now what, what do you learn about uh, uh, the, the church from reading the Acts of the Apostles about the, the way the apostles uh, uh, conducted themselves? What did you learn? And the, one of the first things the student said was, no real estate. And I said, you know, I never thought about that. There is, there is no guidance in the entire New Testament for how the church is to acquire real estate. Uh, there's none of that. No real estate. Matthew 28, Jesus the risen Christ comes to the end of his ministry and he sit, gathers his 12 disciples around him and, and he says to them, now you go and get some good property and remember location, location, location. And when you come to a bank, tell them you're an Elam Monastery organization, they'll give you a better rate that way. No! What does he say to them? Go! Get out of here! Stop standing around here in Jerusalem! Get out! Go into all the world! And I am with you always to the end of the age just to keep you moving. I Go! That's what he says. And I think it's because, let's be honest, it is much easier to follow a dead God that is an idol than it is to follow a risen and living God. Uh, in fact, that's one way you can, if you notice, dead people uh, have no freedom of movement. They, you, you kind of know where they are. 
We thought we knew where Jesus was out at the cemetery. And then these women come running back and they say, no, he's loose. He's left us. He's out in Galilee. What we do is we want to be like the disciples there at Emmaus and say, oh, stay with us. Stay right here, clustered around the table, just us, the closest friends. But if you've got a living God, you've got a God in motion. I think one of the great challenges of the Christian life is worshiping a living God and that takes stamina to keep up with a resurrected living Lord. It's easier if we could get God confined and stabilized and defined. Uh, stay with us. Back in January we had a consultant come in and study Duke Memorial and make a report, tell us what we ought to be doing. And one of the things he said to me on his way out the door was, this church has got to find a way to be more supple and adaptive. You, you really now do not have time to take six months, a year to make an important life-giving decision. Your meetings are too long. You're taking too long to deliberate. You're waiting until you've heard from every person. You've got to be more supple, adaptive. Now, uh, of course, there are reasons for that. I mean, uh, uh, no organization that becomes ossified uh, stays in operation very long. Uh, there are certain changes in the culture, and we got to keep up with those changes. Uh, yeah, okay. But the best reason is we have a living, resurrected Lord who is in motion. That's the best reason. We say, stay with us. Let us pin you down right here among your 12 best friends, right here in this congregation. Stay with us. Abide with us. But he doesn't. At Emmaus, he appears before his astonished disciples, and then he disappears. He moves on to somewhere else. He is God in motion. Uh, elsewhere in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, Abide in me, stay with me, and I will stay with you. We believe that promise, and yet the difficult part about that promise is the first part. Where Jesus says, you abide in me, and, and I'll abide in you. We cannot abide a living God if, if we do not be in motion with that God. I know as my role as a church bureaucrat and going around to congregations, what I would often, I would say to a congregation, uh, tell me how you're doing. Are, are you growing? And a frequent response would be, uh, well, we're not growing, but we're, not, we're, we're, we're holding our own. Well, I, I learned the hard truth is with a living God, nobody holds their own. You're either growing and you're moving or you're dying. There is no sort of holding our own. Abide in me, I'll abide in you. Mary Magdalene there at the tomb on that first Easter in the darkness, she sees a stranger appear to her and she thinks it's a gardener and then he speaks her name, Mary. And then Mary says, it, uh, falls at Jesus, the risen Christ's feet and embraces his feet and holds on to him. And you remember what he says? Do not hold me. Do not attempt to stabilize me. Do not attempt to fix me here in the sweet garden in this location. I am on the move. If you will note, the cross is empty. The tomb is empty. And maybe that means that some of our cherished concepts of God are empty. And maybe it means the possibility that our churches can be empty. Do not hold on to me. And maybe that 
Maybe we're to be reminded of the great adventure of serving a living God rather than a God who is dead and stabilized and fixed out at the cemetery. Had a group of uh, renegade kind of bishops we'd get together and we got together twice a year at Duke Divinity School and we would uh, bring in management consultants to teach us how to be better managers and all and one meeting we were I spent the morning complaining about all the ways the Methodist Church needs to change, all the things that need to be fixed that aren't working well. And we had that afternoon a woman who had only been a Christian for a couple of years, and she was like a, a, a major executive with Google. And she was going to talk to us about management. She, and she began her talk by saying, I'm, I'm new here. I've only been a Christian for a short time. And I understand that your church has got to do a lot of things differently and needs to change. I hear that. But I, let me just say as a newcomer, I'm not sure Google will be here in 10 years. Because in technology, you rise with technology and you die when the technology moves on. But she said, you guys have been here for over two, for, for nearly 2,000 years. Name me another human institution that's been around that long. And she said, I think, from my perspective, the church is the most supple, adaptive, innovative organization the world has ever known. You have never found a culture you could not work to your advantage. Said, Google does not go into a new market until we do a lot of research that proves to us they want us there. You people, if you're told, hey, they don't want you in Chechnya. Uh, they, they, you could get killed in Chechnya. You say, oh, that sounds like a call from Jesus. Let's go to Chechnya. <laughs> you have never, and, and in fact, you find a way to succeed in some of the most hostile territories. I read an article the other day about China's explosion. The church is growing three times faster in China than the Chinese economy is growing. So she says, I'm sorry, but you guys are sort of amazing. Uh, now she could have made that observation from management perspective, an organizational development perspective, and she probably was, but she could have also made it from a theological perspective. There's something about the living God that stays on the move. This past week, the, the Duke Memorial uh, Church Council voted to invite a young congregation uh, into our building to use some of our space when we're not using it, uh, uh, Emmaus Way, a congregation named for this gospel today. Emmaus Way has only been in existence about 10 years. Uh, well, why did we do that? Oh, well, we're going to get some rent out of them. Yeah, uh, we're not really using that space ever, uh, so we can afford it. But, but I think the reason our church council voted to do that is theological. We're determined to follow the risen Christ. This congregation has a medium in, uh, age of 30. That is, tw Duke Memorial is twice the median age of that of Emmaus Way. This congregation has had amazing success over its 10 year life. They started out at Francesca's, they moved to another restaurant, now they're moving here. Well, this congregation has reached a demographic we have been unable to reach. And the reasons are theological, having to do with keeping up with a resurrected Lord. Uh, last, a couple years ago, uh, a, a church historian named Wigger, John Wigger, uh, published uh, autobi a, a biography of Francis Asbury. Francis Asbury, first Methodist bishop, uh, picture over our wall, over our Wesley window here. And I had never realized until then that, that uh, Francis Asbury practiced itinerant ministry. 
That is, keep Methodist preachers moving. Keep them moving west. Keep them going. Keep them on the back of a horse. Keep them uh, uh, moving out. And uh, Francis Asbury was asked uh, if about uh, did we need to have a retirement plan for Methodist preachers? And he said, no, if they're faithful, they won't need to worry about retirement. And, and their average age was, they died in their, their mid-30s. Well, anyway, uh, Asbury kept moving, moving. And I, he believed in itineracy in ministry. Never leave a Methodist preacher long. In fact, in Asbury's book, the worst sin a Methodist preacher could commit was the dreaded sin of location. And some minister would stand up at annual conference when Asbury was presiding and said, I want you to know I'm, <clears throat> and, and the, the question Asbury would ask each minister, are you traveling this year? And then some minister would say, well, I've met a wonderful woman and we're going to get married. And Asbury would, there'd be a gasp among the Methodist preachers and Asbury would say, many who put their hand to the plow look back. I'm sorry, goodbye. And uh, Asbury believed in a tenoracy not just as a good management principle for a growing organization, but as a theological commitment. A tenoracy is what you get when you have an itinerant Lord and Savior. He agreed with Will Rogers who said, Methodist preachers are a lot like manure. You pile them together in one place, they get to stinking. But if you'll spread them around all over the countryside, they can do a lot of good. <laughs> this story of Emmaus, where we say, oh, please abide with us, stay with us, and he does not. That Easter evening, two despondent disciples are walking to the little village of Emmaus. They're walking, they're trudging, they are depressed, they are despondent about all the terrible things that have happened in Jerusalem on Friday. A stranger shows up. They engage the stranger in conversation. They say to the stranger, uh, it's getting dark. Stay with us. Have a, minute, have a meal with us. And there at table, the risen Christ takes the bread. And he breaks the bread. And he gives thanks for the bread. You will see this same action in just a few minutes, live right here on our stage. And their eyes are open and they see the risen Lord. That, that's what we believe happens. But we also note in the story, he disappears. He moves on to break bread with somebody else, somewhere else. And those once despondent disciples who walked to Emmaus, now they run all the way back to Jerusalem, breathless with the cry, we have seen the Lord he was made known to us in the breaking of the bread. This thing is not over. It's just beginning. Lord, give us the stamina to keep up with a resurrected Christ. Amen. And now, having heard the word of Christ, having read his word, let us pray. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, raised from the dead, returned to his disciples, and then moved out into the whole world. Hear us when we pray. Lord, we thank you that you did not leave us alone, but that you showed up among us. We thank you that you did not merely show up among us, but that you got us in motion and mission, that you would not let us be, you would not let us stay where we were, but you kept commanding us, follow me. Lord, you reached out to those who were hurting, those who were sick, those who were grieving, those who were full of doubt, 
those who are confused, body, mind, or soul, we pray that you would continue your healing work. Continue to reach out, especially reaching out to people who find it tough to reach out to you. Lord Jesus, you not only healed and taught, but you spoke the truth. You told the truth to power, to arrogant politicians, to the raging mob. You told the truth to your own disobedient, disheartened disciples. Lord, continue to be a prophet to us. Continue to tell us the truth, even when we don't like it. And give us the grace to hear you tell us the truth without despising you for telling us the truth. Help us in our words and in our deeds to live the truth before a disbelieving world. Lord, we give thanks that you showed up uninvited that you pushed your way in, that you didn't let any of the barriers that we put up between ourselves and you, you kicked those down and you came to us. We are so totally dependent as a church or as individuals uh, for your showing up. Stay with us, Lord and thereby help us to stay with you. Risen Christ on the move. We pray this the way you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I call your attention to the various announcements in the bulletin, uh, we, we're bidding farewell to Sarah Martindale uh, this month, but I want to call your attention to all the mission opportunities listed in the bulletin. If you're a member of Duke Memorial and you're not touched and engaged in at least one of these mission opportunities, you're missing out on some real spiritual blessing. Uh, this church has lots of opportunities uh, to be engaged with the Christ who is so engaged with us. Now let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God for God's work. 